dinner's not ready. Look, you should know by now, Alice. I called twice. Well, don't we check the answering machine now? It's almost ready. Well, it should have been ready five minutes ago. But now I have to wait. You know, I just don't believe it. The bathroom towels are wrinkled. There's a slipper sitting in the living room and my bathrobe is not hung up. You know how I feel about that. You can't even clean the house properly. You don't even work full time. I just don't know what you do with all this spare time that you have. I just don't understand how, I just don't understand how you don't know how to do it right. I just don't understand. Glenn Smolnik has been Alice's husband for 13 years. He's had a lot of time to think. Unfortunately, he's never asked himself this one question. What's it like being married to me? It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible. Still relevant in today's complex world, it is written, sharing hope around the globe. People sink into very bad habits when they don't ask themselves a very important question. What's it like being married to me? That question becomes extremely critical after a marriage has gone through many years of wear and tear. Let's look at a typical example. Bill and Lisa had just celebrated their 15th wedding anniversary. It was a nice occasion. Friends came over to wish them well. They had a nice dinner together. They talked about old times and good memories. Then everyone said good night and Bill and Lisa were left alone in that house, staring at each other. Two lonely people terribly aware of the wall between them. Two exhausted people, exhausted from the strain of pretending to be happily married. The cracks that had always existed in their relationship now had become deep crevasses. Bill was frequently gone on business trips. For years, their conflicts had only been resolved by his lengthy absences. Lisa had tried to build a life of her own, getting a job and widening her circle of friends. But that wasn't enough anymore. She would needed more. And she'd begun to wonder if she could ever get it from her husband. Bill tried. He sincerely wanted the marriage to work, but he wasn't very good at communicating his feelings. He tended to look for an intellectual answer to everything, reading books and pondering abstract questions, while Lisa wanted emotional support. And Lisa, an incurable romantic, had allowed her affections to wander. She'd been crazy about Bill and almost worshipped him. But what before she had regarded as great wisdom she now viewed as Bill's way of controlling her. Bill tried to be more supportive, but by now Lisa had grown quite cold. Why should he keep trying, he told himself, if his wife wasn't going to respond? And Lisa kept questioning Bill's sincerity. He was just trying to control her. Neither of these people wanted a divorce. Their religious and personal convictions had never allowed that option. And yet they couldn't find the will to stay together. They kept groping around in the dark, bumping into each other, less and less able to trust, seeing more and more fatal flaws in the other and little hope for change. Bill and Lisa's story hits close to home for a lot of people today. More and more marriages are falling apart after years of attempts to stay together. Marriages are breaking up in the middle. Couples are giving up on 10, 15, or 20 years of a relationship. Many counsellors believe marriages become especially vulnerable after the kids grow up. Some partners find that raising their children was about the only thing they had in common. Other observers talk about the strains that the midlife crisis brings on. A lot of people who've achieved success in their jobs wake up one morning, look around and ask, is this all there is? There's another factor that contributes to marriages breaking apart in the middle. Now let's be honest. In some home, it's the women who've made the sacrifices, put up with their husband's problems and done what it takes to keep the family together. These women today are tired of playing that role. Too often their long-suffering love turns them into victims of abuse. A lot of them are just plain tired out and upset and they're not going to take it anymore.
For couples under pressure, the obvious answer seems to be change your marriage partner. He or she is the one causing all the problems. What you've got to do is change the person staring back at you across the breakfast table. Now let's face it, sometimes victims do need to be rescued. Sometimes abusers need to be directly and openly confronted. Anyone with a pattern of verbal or physical abuse who refuses to seek help is destroying their marriage. Unfortunately, the language of abuse is now applied to all kinds of situations. Criticising or nagging on occasion is viewed as verbal assault. Some begin to see manipulation or an attempt to control behind every request or comment. People can find passive aggressive behaviour in every silence, every gesture. Common faults can be blown up into great crimes with the language of abuse. There definitely are people who compulsively try to control their spouses, always putting them down, always trying to restrict their friends and interests. But the vast majority of troubled couples are caught in a web of trying to control each other in big and little ways. The road to marital pain and suffering is a two-way street. That's why I'd like to suggest an alternative to simply changing a spouse. It's true something's got to change, but it's not the marriage that's somehow to blame, it's the people in it. People need to change themselves, not just their partners. Hoping that the next person down the line will make you happy is to hope against hope. You'll still be carrying the same baggage into the next relationship. You'll still have your same habits, your same compulsions, your same tendencies. You'll still have the same unresolved hurts. It's people that need to change. Listen to what counsellors say who've talked to hundreds of people on their second time around. The most typical comment is this. If I'd known then what I know now, I would have worked harder, much harder, to keep my first marriage going. When our marriage is under pressure, we're apt to see everything that's wrong, everything that's a problem, except our own behaviour. One marriage counsellor who'd worked with many faltering relationships decided to use a novel technique. He began videotaping the sessions each couple had with him and then giving them an instant replay. The results were remarkable. Husband and wife saw themselves on the screen exactly as they were, body language, intonation, gestures and all. The tapes were so revealing that many couples began to resolve their disputes almost immediately. For the first time in their lives, they got an answer to the question few of us asked, what's it like being married to me? What's it like? People need to change themselves, not just their marriage partners. Any relationship can be salvaged if husband and wife are willing to first let God help them change. Now, admittedly, it's one thing to talk about change and quite another thing to actually do it. After you've spent years in unhealthy ruts, it may seem impossible to get out of them. And you may well believe that the person across the breakfast table won't ever really change. But listen again to this familiar promise from the Old Testament and try to apply it to your own marriage. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 gives hope for troubled and hardened hearts in any marriage relationship. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Yes, damaged marriages can make us hard heartened. They can set our worst qualities in stone. But that's what God's grace is for. That's what the promise of a new heart is for. The New Testament fairly bursts with the theme of radical change. And friends, it doesn't just apply to drunkards in the gutter or profane atheists. It applies to our marriages as well. Listen to Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Paul's prayer is, that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Elizabeth and Steve experienced constant friction in their marriage because of incompatible traits. She was very outgoing, he was painfully shy. 
Usually that meant that Elizabeth would beg Steve to attend some party. He'd make up some excuse and she'd have to go by herself, alone and furious. But instead of just changing partners, they tried changing themselves. Steve started attending a few parties. Slowly he grew more sociable. Elizabeth learned there were some activities she could enjoy quietly at home. Instead of becoming more and more extreme in their traits, these two people became more whole and healthy as human beings. They learned from each other. Here's wonderful advice from the Apostle James on how couples can become more teachable. James chapter 1, verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. That's it in a nutshell. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. That makes us teachable. Instead of just changing our spouses, we need to see if we can learn from our partner. What we see as an incompatible trait in the other person may be trying to tell us something important about ourselves. Now, sometimes it's not just a question of different traits or different interests. Sometimes marriages deteriorate because of real problem behaviours. Take Henry for example. He was something of a malcontent who found fault with everyone and everything. His wife Jean was the usual target of his complaints. For 15 years she tried her best, her very best, to cater to Henry's every whim. She tried so hard to make him happy. Well, Jean finally burned out and went for counselling. But she learned something very important there. No one can make another person happy. She wasn't responsible for her husband's happiness. He was. When Jean accepted this fact, she became more relaxed and outgoing. The pressure was off. And Henry woke up himself when he realised Jean no longer accepted the blame for everything. He began to occupy his time more productively. Sometimes we need to detach ourselves from the problem behaviour of the other person. We can become enablers, helping them to continue in their bad habits. When Jean decided to stop doing that, she found leverage, a positive force to lift her husband. She found that behaving in a healthy way herself nudged her husband toward healthier behaviour. Donna and Ray had for some time been caught in a pattern known as the nag withdrawal syndrome. Donna would nag Ray about not putting his things away and not helping her around the house enough. Ray would become silent and withdrawn. This would drive his wife up the wall and she'd nag even more. After they went for help, Ray recognised what Donna wanted more than anything else was physical attention from him. Her nagging was really an effort to spark some show of emotion. Ray realised that he had leverage. By showing a little more spontaneous affection, he could short-circuit the nagging problem. Ray and Donna began meeting each other's needs instead of driving each other up the wall. The writer of Hebrews gives some advice which I think is especially fitting for couples wrestling with problem behaviour. It's found in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. But exhort one another daily, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. This verse pictures the two directions a relationship can go. You can either encourage each other or harden each other. Those problem behaviours, those deceitful sins, will harden and alienate marriage partners unless we find some leverage, unless we find a positive way to encourage. And often that's by displaying healthy behaviour ourselves. Later in the book of Hebrews, the writer urges in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. If we're just reacting to our spouse's problem behaviour, the marriage will harden. But if we concentrate on our own positive behaviour, chances are our spouses will be moved toward love and good deeds. Recently, Psychology Today reported on a study of 300 couples who've stayed together for many years. They were asked to talk about why they had enduring and happy marriages. Can you guess what the most frequently named reason was? It was simply this, they liked their spouse as a person. Now to couples whose relationship has deteriorated over the years, 
This basic attitude may seem impossible. They think they've seen too much. They remember all the ways their spouses hurt them. But stop for a moment. All of us at one point liked our spouse as a person. When we chose to marry them, we saw things that attracted us. We saw things to love. Our bride or groom had weaknesses and faults, but we didn't look at those. In the enthusiasm of our first love, we noticed only the good things. Well, we may not be able to capture that initial infatuation, but we can recapture that initial perspective. We can make a conscious choice to look at our partner's good qualities. Remember, no matter what our circumstances, we always have a choice. We can either focus on the things we don't like or we can focus on the things we do like. What we look at can make an enormous difference. A young wife named Sandra walked into her pastor's office one day and poured out a long and painful story. She just couldn't do anything to please her husband, Joe. Each day she dreaded the moment he'd come home from work. Joe seemed to treat her with contempt. As it happened, Sandra was an attractive, bright woman, but her sense of rejection had turned her into a depressed, tense and frigid wife. The pastor decided to meet with Sandra's husband. Joe was absolutely amazed when he heard that he was contributing to his wife's depression. Like most men, he didn't understand how well his wife could read his attitude. Fortunately, the pastor had a specific suggestion. Joe, he said, I'd like you to select 10 positive qualities in your wife and thank God for them. Thank God twice a day, in the morning and on the way home from work. That didn't seem terribly difficult and his marriage was deteriorating, so Joe agreed. He began thanking God for the things he liked about Sandra. He began focusing on what attracted him instead of what bothered him. Before long, Sandra started changing before his eyes. She became more cheerful and affectionate. Joe continued to be thankful and Sandra grew in self-respect and motivation. She broke out of the walls of her depression. After a while, the pastor asked Joe if he'd memorized his list of 10 positive qualities. The husband beamed. I'm finding new things in her to be grateful for every day. A little gratitude goes a long, long way, believe me. Focusing on positive qualities makes them expand. So please, don't just change your partner if your present mate seems unsatisfactory. Most people just end up with someone with a slightly different mix of bad and good qualities. Instead, change your perspective. Change what you focus on. This is most effective, of course, if both partners promise to do that together. Two people looking for the best in each other can overcome almost any obstacle. Psychologist Carl Rogers once wrote this. When I walk on the beach to watch the sunset, I don't call out, a little more orange over to the right, please, or would you mind giving us less purple in the back? No, I enjoy the always different sunsets as they are. We do well to do the same with the people we love. Today we're experiencing an epidemic of the wrong kind of change, people changing their partners, when what really needs to change is the human heart. So please remember to ask that all-important question, what's it like being married to me? Please remember that God can take out our hearts of stone and replace them with hearts of flesh. With God's resources at your disposal, no situation is hopeless. So start learning from your partner's differences instead of just criticizing them. Start using the right kind of leverage to change problem behaviors and start focusing on the positive qualities in your mate that once held your devoted attention. Please don't just look for a magic solution to your problems in a new face. There are people who go through their whole lives moving from one relationship to another, thinking happiness is just around the corner and never, never dealing with the real problems in their own hearts, never facing what really needs to change. Don't fall into that trap. By God's grace, we can all change. We can change ourselves 
instead of just trying to change our partners. Let's make that commitment now as we pray. Father in heaven, we need help. Marriages are deteriorating. Relationships are falling apart. And sometimes the walls built up between us seem insurmountable. Sometimes it seems there's just too much hurt and anger to overcome. But we acknowledge right now that you can give us the support and the power to make positive changes in our lives. So we ask for the strength that the Holy Spirit alone can give. We ask for your divine energy. Please help us move our marriages out of their ruts and into your hands. In Jesus' name, Amen.